Chapter 83, 5th year, January. Saturday the 4th of January, 1976. The rest of the Christmas break passed in a shaky black and white sort of way. The Potters hosted a small gathering for New Year's Eve, but very few people came. Many of their close circle were now working for Dumbledore, Mrs Potter explained, and busy with the war effort, whatever that was. Their peripheral friends had either turned their backs on the Potters, we're blood traitors, James proudly declared, or else were simply too frightened to associate themselves. Moody would not hear of Mrs Potter taking Sirius to Diagon Alley, but he needed shoes to begin the new term, so they all sloped down to the village one afternoon. There, Sirius had fallen madly in love with a pair of brand new black Doc Martins with bright yellow laces. Remus was pretty jealous. His own pair had been knockoffs from down the market and had fallen apart long ago. On their way back from town, they'd passed a couple of punks, a very odd sight in this little country village, but Remus supposed there were teenagers everywhere. One of them had a row of heavy silver rings in the cartilage of one ear. The other had green hair. Mrs Potter had forbidden any dyeing of hair, but the night before school was due to begin, Remus had relented after hours of Sirius's begging and helped him pierce one of his earlobes using his prefix pin and a potato. It had bled a lot, but Sirius was thrilled. Thus, he presented himself before Remus the morning they were setting off for London. He had messed up his hair for volume, flipped it over one shoulder to show off his new gold earring, stood with his legs apart like a guitarist, hands in his pockets, big black bother boots. Muggle in sight! He grinned at Remus, putting a cigarette between his teeth. How do I look? Like a twat, James said. Like a rock star, Remus said, groaning inwardly. He was doomed. He had thought, hoped really, that Sirius's trauma might have cooled Remus's considerable ardour towards his best friend, might jolt him into realising that, as friendship was all they would ever have, He ought to focus his energies on just being a bloody good friend. But no, Sirius was a demigod, and Remus was helpless to do anything but worship him. You silly lovesick prat, he told himself. At any rate, Remus was glad to be going back to Hogwarts, where lines were very clearly drawn, and there were exams to focus on. Sirius turned heads at King's Cross. Muggles didn't give him half a glance, but wizards... Or, more accurately, witches stared. Mary came cackling over to him on the platform in a pair of turquoise suede boots with a heel that brought her up to his height. Hiya, gorgeous, she chirped, then hugged him fiercely, and Remus caught the look on his face over her shoulder. He looked pleased. It must be nice, after a hard time, to hold someone in your arms like that, especially someone as emotionally open as Mary. Remus allowed his own pain to peak, then subside, slowly, concentrating on smiling and listen to Marlene tell him all about her Christmas. Once aboard, they bundled into their usual carriage, and Remus would be forever thankful to Lily, who suggested that he joined her in patrolling the length of the train a few times. "'You look like you could do with some air,' she smiled up at him. "'Yeah, cheers. Stuffy in there. "'Full-on Christmas with the marauders, then?' "'You can say that.' Poor Remus. She linked her arm with his, leaning against him slightly. It felt nice, like a mini cuddle. She had a small, soft sort of body. Maybe that was the attraction with girls. I heard about Sirius, she said very quietly. Is he okay? Yeah, Remus nodded. Think so. How'd you know? Uh, Sev told me, actually. I didn't believe him, but based on Sirius's new look. Fuck, how does he know? Lily shrugged. Does everyone know? Only that he's been kicked out and disinherited. No one knows why. She was looking at him, and he realised she wanted him to tell her why. It's complicated, he said. I don't think he'd want everyone to know. You're a good friend, she patted his arm. Yeah. He thought bitterly. I'm a great friend, me. All I think about is Sirius. Sirius's safety. Sirius's happiness. 
Sirius's hands, Sirius's neck, Sirius's mouth, Sirius throwing me down on the bed and stop. No, not the time, fuck's sake. Oi! Lily was shouting suddenly, pointing down the long corridor of the moving train. If that's you, Crouch, I'll have your guts for garters. Barty Crouch. Remus's stomach turned. He had been there on Christmas Eve. Nasty little creep. The fair-haired fourteen-year-old was tormenting some first-year girls, levitating their book bags over their heads. Lily, ever fearless, marched over, threatening detention, loss of points, and even a few hexes. He sneered at her, but let the bags drop. Barty, what are you... Oh. The door of the nearest compartment slid open, and Regulus Black appeared. His eyes narrowed at Lily. What do you want, Evans? No need to be so rude, she tutted. She raised an eyebrow at Crouch. Stay out of trouble, or I'll be speaking with Slughorn. You're on thin ice already, and you know it. Come on, Remus. She glanced back at Lupin, who was still standing a little way back, hoping to avoid doing his prefect duty. Regulus's head snapped back. He stared at Remus, and all of the arrogance vanished. He looked so much younger. Lupin, he said stiffly. Remus just nodded. Regulus opened his mouth once or twice. He obviously wanted to ask. Remus wanted to hit him, but not in front of Lily, who remembered Sirius's desperate concern for his brother and saw it reflect back at him in Regulus's eyes. He's fine, Remus blurted out. Regulus blinked, then nodded, then turned back into his car, slamming the door. Barty scratched his head in shock, looking very confused. Thursday, the 15th of January, 1976. As the second term got into full swing, Remus realised he needn't have worried so much. He didn't even have to try to avoid Sirius. Owls were just around the corner now, scheduled to begin in May, and if the fifth-year students thought their workload had been heavy during the first term, they were in for a very rude awakening. Remus combated this added stress by spending every spare hour he could in the library or in the common room perfecting practical spells. By the third week, he found that he had somehow become the unelected leader of a sort of homework and revision club. A group of fifth years, and even some younger students, had started coming to him for tips or advice on their own work. Lupin, what's the flicky bit you do for your locomotive spells? I keep doing it wrong. Remus, Remus, is it... A parisium or a parisium. Hey Lupin, can you show me how you did that timeline again? I keep forgetting. Remus pretended that he found the whole thing a huge imposition, but he was secretly thrilled. He was good at something. The marauders, when he saw them, thought it was hilarious and had taken to calling him Professor. One student in particular had started joining him for regular study sessions, a fourth-year Gryffindor called Christopher Barley. He was quiet and studious, with serious dark eyes and long slender fingers. He was shy, but when Remus said hello to him, he gave an incredible smile, lighting up from the inside. Remus realised, after the third or fourth time he bumped into Christopher somewhere in the castle, by coincidence, that the younger boy had a crush on him. I'm getting better at this, he thought. The feeling was, unfortunately, not at all mutual. Remus was flattered, of course, it was hard not to be, but he couldn't summon up any feelings beyond sympathy for Christopher. Neither of them were brave enough to say anything, which was just as well. On top of this, Remus had his prefect duties, which seemed to multiply with each week. After Hufflepuff and Muggleborn, prefect had been hexed before Christmas on a nightly patrol and had not been found until the next morning. Each head of houses demanded that prefects patrol in pairs at all times. These patrols had become a nightly farce for Remus, as he spent most of the time trying to direct Lily away from wherever the other three marauders were out of bed, working on some nefarious scheme or other. This worked most of the time. The problem was that since Christmas, James and Sirius had become even more daring than ever. Armed with the marauder's map and the invisibility cloak, they navigated the castle like a pair of pirates, pillaging and laying waste. Several times, Remus would get back from patrol and find them not in their beds, only for the boys to return an hour later laughing and full of bravado, telling him how they had almost been caught this time. Almost. 
Quidditch, too, kept them busy and apart from Remus. The match with Slytherin had been the first game of the year and resulted in a tie, which meant that both houses were now competing ruthlessly for the cup. With James now at the helm, the Gryffindor team was practising twice as often every week, and Potter was dragging Sirius out every morning at the crack of dawn for a jog. In fact, between Remus's desire to study, his group of disciples, and his prefect duties, his scant free time barely ever seemed to coincide with that of his friends. He barely even saw them at meal times or before bed, except for Peter, whose only extracurricular activity was his girlfriend. So, it came as something of a surprise one night in mid-January, when Remus bumped into Sirius. It was a routine patrol, and Remus and Lily's last of the week. The full moon was due in two days, and Remus had cunningly manipulated the prefect's rotor to avoid those nights. He had offered to take charge of the rotor for their house, in fact, and the rest of Gryffindor prefects were obviously relieved. They were all good at their jobs, of course, with a strong sense of justice and fairness, combined with the courage to do the right thing, but few Gryffindors could ever be bothered with the admin. Remus seized the opportunity, and it had so far served him well. "'Come on now,' Lily said, as they descended the flight of stairs from the astronomy tower, usually a hot spot for after-curfew activity. Tonight it was deserted. "'The main ingredients in a calming draught. List them.' "'Ah,' uh, Remus huffed, and his hip clicked on the last stair. He was just glad he had a lot of energy shortly before the moon. "'Lacewing flies, dew from a field of clover, seawater, and, um... "'Oh, come on, Remus!' Lily sighed, exasperated. "'This is fourth year stuff!' "'I know, but I can never... "'Wait, did you hear that?' "'What?' Shh. He was sure he had heard a sigh or a gasp, and now, in the perfect silence, he was aware that he could hear two more heartbeats nearby, pounding hard, and the scent of something else, something exciting and heady. He ripped back the nearest tapestry, raising his wand. Lumos! Shit! Mary! Lily gasped. Mooney! Sirius said. What are you two doing? Lily said immediately adopting her authoritative voice, which Remus thought was eerily close to McGonagall's. "'Can't guess, Evans,' Sirius winked at her. His arms were still protectively wrapped around Mary's waist. His hair had fallen forward untidily, and his mouth was redder than usual. Mary's blouse was unbuttoned, almost down to her navel, and she was hurriedly trying to cover up. "'We ought to give you both detentions!' Lily raised an eyebrow at her friend. "'Oh, be nice, Lily!' Mary cajoled, a soft smile on her lips. Everyone does it, just a bit of fun. Well, as this is the first time, Lily relented. Come on, we're heading back to the tower now anyway. Five more minutes? Sirius asked cheekily, much to Lily's horror. Mary laughed and slapped him playfully. Bad boy, she giggled, buttoning up her shirt. Come on, it's not like anything else was happening tonight. The four of them walked back to Gryffindor common room together, the girls giggling and whispering together, occasionally sneaking glances back at Sirius, before bursting into giggles all over again. Sirius played up to this, walking with an exaggerated swagger, tucking his long hair behind one ear and winking at them as they looked. He tried to catch Remus's eye a few times, as if to let him in on the joke, but Remus kept looking forward and said nothing. "'All right, Mooney?' Sirius asked, when they were all in their beds and had still not spoken. He sounded a bit worried now. Good, thought Remus. Yep, Remus replied, rolling over and closing his eyes. Chapter 84, Fifth Year, Hurt Feelings Monday the 18th of January, 1976 Remus Lupin had absolutely no interest whatsoever in the Forbidden Forest at any other time of the month. Care of magical creatures had given him a healthy respect for the beasts who lived there, and he was inclined to give them a wide berth. The wolf clearly felt otherwise. Sirius and James, or rather, Prongs and Padfoot, as they were now known, had very little trouble leading the werewolf out of the shack and into the green velvet darkness of the woods. Remus's memories of the full moons were much better than they had ever been, 
but still not quite human, and therefore less complete. He remembered scents, shapes, noises, and even tastes sometimes. We can't stop you chasing rabbits if you want to chase rabbits, James shrugged, when Remus woke up that morning, distressed by the blood on his tongue. You seemed pretty happy about it at the time. It was bloody good fun, Sirius put in, licking his own lips. You were encouraging me, Remus accused, pulling his trousers on underneath his blanket. You ought to know better. You have self-control. Yeah, Sirius shrugged. But when I'm a dog, I'm a dog. It's what we do. That was Sirius all over. Have all the fun and take no responsibility. Don't worry, Mooney, James yawned. We wouldn't ever let you hurt a person. And you did have fun, I promise. He didn't need James to tell him that. As much as the human Remus preferred to remain aloof and separate himself from those baser instincts the wolf represented, he couldn't wait for the next moon. You'd better be off, he yawned back. See if I can get a bit of kip before breakfast. Yeah, all right, James nodded sleepily. See you, Mooney. By prongs. Prongs had been a stroke of genius one afternoon, when Peter had forgotten the word antlers. They'd all laughed so hard the name had stuck. Remus wasn't sure where Padfoot had come from. Likely a private joke between Sirius and James. Anyway, it made sense, and they had settled into their new names comfortably, sealing them into the Marauder's Map. Madame Pomfrey gave him one once over when they arrived, then sent him on his way. I don't need a stretcher anymore, she marvelled. And you've got good colour in your cheeks. Rest this morning, but if you're feeling up to it, you may as well attend your afternoon lessons. He felt terrible for lying to her about the reason for his miraculous recoveries, but it couldn't be helped. Remus managed to sleep through the rest of the morning and awoke a bit too early for lunch. He went down to the common room to sit by an open window and smoke while he went over his history notes for the afternoon. All things considered, he thought to himself, other than the serious problem, life was going pretty well. Sirius had fumbled an apology about the astronomy tower incident. Remus heavily suspected this was a result of a conference with James. Sorry, Mooney. I should have checked with you, or used the map or something. I know you hate all that girl stuff, and I know you've done loads to keep us out of trouble this year. Remus had put on a great show of mulling his apology over, then forgiving his friend, because anything else would have been highly suspicious. He was mortified when even Mary came to offer her own apology, and spluttered that he hadn't minded in the least. He liked Mary. He didn't want to feel this way about her. None of it was her fault, exactly. And, as James so often said, Cyrus deserved a bit of fun, considering the year he was having. Hi, Remus, a small voice interrupted his thoughts. He realised he hadn't so much as glanced down at his notes yet, and his cigarette had burnt all the way down, unsmoked. Hi, Christopher, Remus nodded, frowning as he brushed the ash off his sleeve. You okay? Yeah, the younger boy grinned and hopped up to join him on the window seat. He was smaller than Remus, but so was everyone. What are you up to? History, Remus said through his teeth as he lit another fag. Cool, Christopher grinned. Remus raised an eyebrow but said nothing. I I won't bother you then, Christopher said hopefully, if you're, if you're busy. What's up? Remus asked not wanting to hurt his feelings. There were enough hurt feelings in the world, and he refused to be responsible for anyone's but his own. Um, well, nothing really. It's a Hogsmeade weekend this weekend. Yeah, I know. Rumour shifted uncomfortably in the seat. Surely Christopher wouldn't be so gauche as to ask him out. He had to nip it in the bud at once. I, uh, I'm going with my mates, you know. Oh, right, uh, James Potter and Sirius Black and, and that other one. Mm-hmm. He could tell that Christopher, like most of the younger Gryffindors, teetered between awe and fear where the marauders were concerned. 
They were simply so daring and so successful, it was intimidating. Well, I was just thinking, that's all. Christopher cleared his throat. You know how we were talking about that new arithmetic book? I, I thought we could see if anywhere was stocking it yet. Sorry, Christopher, Remus said as gently as possible. Uh, I really am busy. Uh, maybe another time? Okay. Yeah, of course. Christopher looked crestfallen. Remus felt bad. But what else could he do? And he really did have plans. Not with the marauders, actually. He had another phone call planned with Grant. After the incident with Sirius and Mary, Remus had hastily scribbled down a request to speak with Grant and sent it to Matron the first thing next morning. He somewhat regretted that now, having calmed down a fair bit, but was still looking forward to speaking with Grant, if he could. Hiya, Mooney! Sirius came bounding across the common room from the portrait hole he'd just entered through. He leaned against the wall beside Remus and Christopher, grinning that serious black grin. Hi, Padfoot. Remus smiled back. He hoped he didn't look at Sirius the way Christopher looked at him. That would be embarrassing. So, settle a bet for me on prongs, Sirius began, completely ignoring Christopher, who got up and mumbled a goodbye before making a hasty exit. Sirius wasted no time in flinging himself into the empty space on the window seat. How many nifflers would we need to find Rowena Ravenclaw's lost diadem? What the fuck is a diadem? Remus smirked. It's like a crown. Sirius snatched Remus's newly lit cigarette and held it to his own lips. Remus had to struggle not to moan at the sight. He simply took out a third cigarette. Why? he said, inhaling deeply. Why would you and James want a crown? Dunno, Sirius shrugged. Finding treasure seems like a marauder-type pursuit. Hey, what did that kid want? Christopher. Ah, is he in your fan club? Study group. Psh, what did he want? He was asking me out, Rumors replied dryly, looking out of the window. Apparently not dryly enough, when he looked back at Sirius, his mouth was agape. Joking, Padfoot, Remus said, with a smirk. He had perfected sarcastic smirks. Sirius snorted. Good one, Mooney. I thought you were serious there. Remus considered saying, no, you're serious. But that joke had been wearing thin since first year, and would only earn him a punch in the arm. He settled for a shrug, and another pull on his fag. If you did fancy going out with someone, though, Sirius said slyly, who do you reckon, Lily or Marlene? Shut up, Remus rolled his eyes. Mm, you're right, Sirius continued conversationally. Lily's taken. I mean, she doesn't know she's taken, of course. So Marlene it is, Hogsmeade on Saturday. Are you asking me out on Marlene's behalf? Maybe. No. I can get her to ask you out herself, if you want. I just thought you'd say yes to me. I'd say yes to you, Remus thought pathetically. Marlene's not interested in me, he said. This, he had decided, was better than saying, I'm not interested in her, because, of course, that would only invite the question, why not? Of course she is, you're friends, aren't you? Anyway, you have to come. We're doing it to support James. Now James is involved. Remus stubbed out his cigarette and stood up, shoving his history notes into his bag. They obviously weren't getting read now. Lunch? He said. Yep. Sirius nodded, flicking his own cigarette out of the window and stood up. They headed for the portrait hall. Yes, James is involved, Sirius continued, as they made their way to Great Hall. We all need to be there and ideally coupled up, so that he can ask Evans out. James asks Lily out once a week. True, Sirius nodded, but this time he's going in with a game plan. Oh, he's got a song and everything. James writes songs? Remus's mask dropped for a moment in genuine surprise. Well, Sirius licked his lips. I may have given him a hand. Anyway, we all need to have dates to plant the idea in her mind, like that muggle psychology stuff. 
as much as I'd love to see James make a prat out of himself in the name of true love, Remus said. I'm busy on Saturday. Doing what? None of your business. <sighs> see, Mooney, Sirius sighed. This is why the girls can't get enough of you. So mysterious. Remus wasn't sure if Sirius was making a cruel joke, so he left it there. They walked quietly for a bit. Hey, Mooney, Sirius started again. Yes? Do you fancy Mary? What? They had stopped just outside the lunch hall, and Remus spun around to face Sirius in shock. Sirius looked embarrassed, fiddling with his earring. Well, you've been a bit off since we started going out, and I've hardly seen you since uh, the tapestry fiasco. Remus snorted. No, I do not fancy Mary. Okay, good. Sirius smiled at him. So, you'll be Marlene's date? Still busy, sorry. Saturday the 31st of January, 1976. Remembering the last time he had tried to have a private phone call, he had been followed... Remus asked to borrow James's cloak for their trip into Hogsmeade. Good old James, you could rely on him to not ask loads of questions, especially when he was distracted by his nerves over asking Lily out. Yeah, of course, Mooney, of course, he muttered, staring at himself in the mirror. It's under the bed. Hey, would you say my hair needs trimming? It looks a bit untidy. It does look untidy, Remus said from under the bed. But trim won't help. Don't worry, girls think it's charming. Yeah? Yeah, you're right. You've asked her out before, Remus said, emerging with the cloak and brushing the dust from his robes. How can you be nervous? Because I'm bloody mad about her, James replied, without missing a beat. You know, when you just can't get them out of your head, and in your head it's great, and everything's going the way you want, but then they're there in front of you and... Well, it all goes to shit, because she's just so much more spectacular in real life, you know? Yep, Remus murmured, thumbing the fabric of the invisibility cloak, as Sirius exited the bathroom. Down in the village, Remus wished James good luck before disappearing into the gents at the three broomsticks, throwing on the cloak and then walking straight out again. This time, he was able to arrive at the old muggle phone box exactly at the right time, and excitedly keyed in the number. Oi oi! Happy New Year and all that! Grant's voice rattled up the wire. Remus beamed. Happy New Year! I had a card for you, but I never sent it. Sorry. As long as you remember my birthday! Oh, uh, okay. When is it? Grant barked with laughter. I'm joking, you silly sod. I never sent you no card either. Oh, still taking yourself too seriously then? <laughs> yeah, Remus chuckled. I suppose. How are you? Shit, Grant replied, his voice going slightly high as he inhaled. Remus guessed he was smoking. Bloody terrible, actually. But don't you worry, my problem. No, tell me, go on. Might be able to help. Just matron, don't worry. Hey. How are things with your posho lover boy? Over it yet? No, Remus sighed. Worse, if anything. Yeah, thought as much. You said it wouldn't last. Lied to make you feel better. Remus couldn't help but laugh. Thank God for Grant. I feel like I'm going mad, he said, whispering into the phone the secrets he hadn't been able to say out loud. I feel like I'm just going to do something crazy. He's so... Be careful, Grant warned. Remember what I said? Yeah, Remus sighed again. So, how was your Christmas? Crap, I was supposed to go to Minigrand's, but my granddad cancelled it at the last minute. Didn't want his Nancy boy grandson showing him up in front of the neighbours. Next time I see him, I'll wear a dress. Sorry, Grant. Remus said quietly, feeling even worse about not having sent the card. Nah, shut up, Grant replied, and Remus could tell he was smiling. Like I said, not your problem. Oi, I might not be here for much longer, though. I'm, uh, probably going to be moved on. 
haven't exactly been going to school. Where will you go? Dunno. I'm thinking I'm done with Ohms. Might go up to London. Got some mates there. How will I find you? Bless ya, Grant said. Forgot how sweet you was. You give me your address and I'll do my best to write. I, I can't. Remus felt a horrible tearing on the inside. I'm really sorry. I, w- I wish I could. I really do. My school isn't really a normal sort of school. And, well, it's not really possible. Well, that's that then, Grant replied. Remus trudged back to the village with a heavy heart. All that obsessing over Sirius had come to nothing, and now he was at risk of losing someone just as important. Someone who actually fancied him back, too. Apparently, Remus was only interested in people he couldn't have. He would look up locating spells as soon as possible, he decided. He wasn't going to lose track of Grant like that. He was mildly cheered up upon entering the three broomsticks, to see Snape sitting alone in a corner, glaring about the room. Remus went straight back into the gents, removed the cloak, and then walked out, being sure to catch Severus's eye. The Slytherin boy nearly fell out of his bar stool in surprise. Remus smirked as he walked over to join his friends. They were all there, Peter and Desdemona, Sirius and Mary, Marlene, James and Lily. Lily looked very pink in the face, but very smug, and James was looking at the bottom of his empty glass. He was dripping wet and smelled sickly sweet. Evidently, the serenade had not gone down well. Mooney! Sirius boomed invitingly. You missed all the fun! Yeah, sorry. Remus smiled politely at everyone, pulling out his own chair. Sirius motioned to the pretty barmaid for another butterbeer. Uh, Remus glanced at James, then Lily. How is everyone? Peter let out a strange, high-pitched giggle, then clamped his hand over his mouth. Sirius raised an eyebrow. I'm oh, quite well, Mooney, quite well. I was just saying, it's been a while since the marauders have done a proper prank. You put stink bombs under the rug in the Slytherin common room last week, Lily said. And yesterday you reversed the lenses on all of the telescopes in the astronomy tower, Marlene said. And you said that tomorrow you were planning to... Mary started, but Sirius rolled his eyes. Yeah, yeah, but those things are child's play, he said decidedly. Plus, that was just me and James mucking about. A proper marauder prank needs all four of us. Remus doesn't want to join in with your silly pranks, Lily said. Yes, I do, Remus replied. Partly because he was in a bad mood and felt contrary. Partly out of solidarity for poor James, who still had butterbeer dripping from the end of his nose. End of chapter 84